we're here with Heather Barrett and Xavier Campbell. Guys, thanks so much for coming down. We're going to do an episode of Woody Act here in just a moment, but I figured before we did, we try this little writing game. So I think that'd be really cool. What do you think? Sure, hey. Let's try it out. Ooh, recording live from the Kitty Bitty Brewery Tap Room in St. John's, Newfoundland. This is Woody Act. Yeah. We have a special appearance by Matthew Wallace and featuring our guests of honor tonight, Heather Barry and Saber Campbell. Now, make some noise for your funky fresh host. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, thank you for another episode of What Do You Act? It's a marvelous evening, isn't it? I think so. We have an exciting show planned for you tonight, folks. We have comedian Matthew Wallace here tonight. Yes, yes. We also have our guests of honor, Heather Barrett and Xavier Campbell, who authored the book titled Black Harbor. An exciting episode, I can't wait. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about a recent experience I had shopping for light bulbs. Anybody here rocking the 5K these days? No? Nobody? Okay, so just so you know, 5K is like the daylight light bulbs. Now, first of all, when I say 5K, I'm almost picturing somebody going around the streets be like, Hey, man, you want some 5K? And I'm like, no, nah, no. Nah. But what it is is it's like a nice bright light. I really enjoy it. And so we went out shopping, and my wife grabs this box and it says, soft white. And uh, so I got home and I put them in, and as soon as I turned them on, I was like, oh my goodness. It just looked like the whole bathroom was painted with like a yellow highlighter, it was terrible. Uh, and the bottom line is we both agreed that they're gonna have to go back and we're gonna have to get the bright white 5K lights. So if you're out there shopping for lights, 5K is the way to go in my opinion. Are you ready to have your socks knocked off? I know I am. Let's get uh, Matthew Wallace up on here. Give him a hand, everybody. Woo! Thank you for having me, guys. This is, uh, this is lovely. Uh, first time ever, well, actually not first time ever having three cameras pointed at me, but it was a different scenario then. But at least I know I have been on camera before. Ding. <laughs> Sorry, Mom and Dad. Um, yeah, so I am Matthew Wallace. That is, uh, that is who I am, and I hail from the town of Carboneer. Uderunabi, that's where I come from. And growing up as a very obviously gay child, growing out there, like, it's really, really funny, you know, because, like, small town, it goes on. But anyway, so one of the things that I love about growing up in Carboneer is uh, my mother, I must say. I, everybody, like, everybody has, like, the classic Newfoundland mother, but my mom was, like, the boss Newfoundland mother. She raised everybody, every child in the neighborhood to the point that, like, Everybody like loved coming over to the house, but also was terrified. You know, it was kind of like if you f***ed up in the house, Wanda would tell you. Big W. Yeah, that's what we called her. My friends wanted to like always come over like, oh, for lunchtime, your parents are gone. Let's go over and like we'll skip school and blah, blah, blah. And my fr other friend would be like, you don't know Wanda. She, Amanda would be like, no, but, like we can just go over. Like she'll never know. And Becky is just like, you don't know Wanda. You don't know Wanda. Sure enough, we did that one day, skipped school one day. Mom comes home, who'd you have over to the house today? And I was like, nobody, just some friends, just some friends. But she was the best mother in the world. Best thing ever, because like she kept us in line. As kids, we would get so annoyed when she'd try anything new in the kitchen. The poor woman was just trying to change our palates and give us a little spice, a little joie de vivre, or whatever the f it is. And uh, we, me and my sister and my brother kicked up a storm because she put garlic and parsley in our potatoes. And we were like, no, nope, no, nope, something's wrong here. Something's going on here. She's like, oh, it's a bit of parsley. You can barely taste it. And then later on, she, was, she let it slip and she was like, oh, it's just a bit of garlic and parsley. And we were like, what? Are you kidding me? Oh, next thing you're gonna say, you're gonna put pepper in here. Anyway, have a good night. My name is Matthew Wallace and uh, Thanks for having me. Ah, Matthew Wallace, everybody. Again, thank thank you. you so much. Excellent. I will. 
Matthew, thanks for coming out, man. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a very interesting experience. I'm loving it. Oh, yeah. Man. So good. glad. It's always a good time over I here. always knew I was meant to be on camera, so yes. that's fine. That's and fair. And your hair looks amazing, by the way. Uh, thank you. I actually washed it today. It's, it's a process sometimes, you know? You got to have, like, hair wash days every so often. You know what? I don't have a lot of hair, but I, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. When, you, when it gets longer, that's apparently something that you have to learn. Like, you have to learn that when your hair, when you grow it out. It's like, oh, wow. If you wash it too often, then it just oh, it's like man. frizzy. And then I have white piece per people hair, so it's like fine and fair and flowy. Yeah, it's got no oomph. No oomph. Like, what have you got going on these days? Like, I mean, I've seen you around at a few open mics. And... Yeah. I always do the comedy show at the Peter Easton, like every Wednesday at 8 p.m. And then um, I do a bunch of other like open mic kind of things, like whenever I get offered new funny comedy show, like I, I've signed up for those as well, which is really good because it's just for um, marginalized communities kind of a thing like so that's been really good I've done like one show with them it was a sober show and I I'm actually going to be hosting and headlining on February 1st my show Uncork Comedy at Court uh, Court yeah it's on Duckworth Street uh, in the lower part of the Mix Hotel or Mix yeah. Apartments. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a blonde moment there. Yeah. So was, <laughs> sometimes the blonde just, it's natural, but it just seeps right into the brain. <laughs> and I'm like, what was I talking about? This, I'm really curious to know, is there a, like a local comic that, you know, you look up to uh, or that you admire or respect a lot? Um, well, oh my God, well, we had Mary J here uh, tonight. I. She warms my heart, and like she did a, sh a set down to Aaron's cup or last this past Thursday. Oh my God, I almost cried because like she's doing so good. She like just you know really, 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 oh love. But actually, my big sister in comedy is Sarah Walsh, and she's nice. a local comic here too. And she kind of like really pushed me. Took a year for her to get me to actually go up on stage and stuff, but she was very much like the driving force to be like shut. The up. Oh, <laughs> <Okay. Okay. laughs> you got to do this. Like, just get it over with. And then she signed me up or said that I, like, told me to go to the Peter Easton and she was going to be there. She was going to, like, encourage me, blah, 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 give me some pointers, yada, yada, yada. Last minute, like, a half or 15 minutes before I even, like, left to go there, she was just like, yeah, I'm not going to make it tonight, but good luck. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. What a good big sister would do, you know? Yeah. Just throw you into the fold, yeah, which was good, yeah. That's amazing. And you know what I'm just going to say right now? Sarah, if you're listening, I'd like to see you on the show, too. That'd be your laugh. I would love that, too, yeah. yeah. She is so good, yeah. yeah. Excellent. I, it's always the women. The women inspire me. What do you think was the biggest challenge that you had to overcome uh, to get as comfortable as you are with comedy because you do feel like you appear very comfortable. God, you flatter me, sir. Um, I would have to say, uh, I think just getting up and doing it was really my thing. I was so in my head about it and I was worried that like, oh, like, you know, you were nervous on the stage when you did like theater growing up as a kid or when you did like other things. So it's like, I got so in my head that I thought that I was just gonna get up there and freeze. Mm -hmm. But honestly, like having five minutes to just get up on stage and everybody has to hear me talk about myself, that is a dream come true. Give me 10 minutes, give me a half an hour, honey. I can't wait for my Netflix special, like, you know? And I, I hear about this thing called crowd work and I was like, why would I want to ask other people about the show? I want to hear, I want to hear myself talk. Just kidding. Ding. <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Heather Barrett, Xavier Campbell and I, we took a moment earlier and we wrote three stories is kind of like a fun game. So I'm going to ask Matthew here to pick one of these stories at random. And these have never been read or seen since they've been written, so I'd like you to pick one, and you're going to read it however you wish. You can emphasize whatever words, you can do... Excellent, I can, yeah, have, I can use have an accent. Creative expression here, and okay. I'm going to take a sip of beer. Well, I'm going to take the biggest one. There you go. Are you ready? Yeah, I guess I'm so. I'm going to take my drink right now. It was an unusually sunny day in Kitty Vitty Village. I sat on the deck of the brewery, drinking a pint and checking my email. Suddenly, the eagle that lives up the hill swooped down and stole my cell phone. That's a strong eagle. I said, hey, eagle, that mouse is not going to be enough food for your babies. <laughs> the eagle dropped the mouse onto a pile of red. Is this the name of my cat, he said. What is Red doing here, she asked. The big bad wolf 
But she did not answer. The wolf huffed and puffed, but he was a smoker, so he didn't blow anything down. <laughs> Is that it? That was good. <laughs> what the? And I get to keep my beer. Matthew Wallace, thank you so much for coming out, man. Thank you for that nonsensical story. I love that. Amazing. All right, folks. So before we move on to our next guest, let's take a break and hear a word from our sponsors, shall we? We'll be right back. All right. Actually, we don't have any sponsors yet. But this space here could be all yours for the cool tune of $1 million. Now, let's get back to our regular scheduled programming. Our guest this evening was Heather was raised right here in St. John's, Newfoundland. I'm going to read this this time. She's a journalist, a storyteller, and an award-winning radio documentary producer and host with CBC. Xavier is a Jamaican-born writer who makes Newfoundland his home. He feels living in Jamaica has somehow prepared him for living on the rock. His fiction has been published in the Malahat Review, Riddle Fence, and several anthologies. His second play, One Name, was workshopped by Halifax Theatre for Young People. Let's have a very warm welcome for Heather Barrett and Xavier Campbell, everybody. Hey, Heather. Hey, love to see ya. Thank you. Xavier, That's man. Right. No problem. Yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you dropping by. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no yeah. problem. No problem. So, I wanted to start with you, Heather. Like, I understand you were raised here in St. John's, so I just would like to know where you're from and what it was like for you to grow up there. Okay, well, I'm from St. John's. I grew up in the East End. Ooh. I could... You send people a shout out. Uh, so just up over the hill from Kitty Vitty Brewery. Nice. Still live in the east end of St. John's. This is my local. Um, and I'm a Generation Xer, so I grew up in St. John's before the oil came. Okay, nice. So it was perma recession. I'm of the generation of like Rick Mercer and Alan Doyle, all those crowds. So I'm, I'm of that vintage. Okay. So it, it was um, a lot more, it felt a lot smaller and a lot less worldly at that point. You know, a lot more white, a lot more sort of insular, but I guess really we are on the ocean, so we were part of everything that came around the Atlantic. Yes, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and for Xavier, how about yourself? Like, I mean, where did you grow up and what was it like for you to grow up there? Uh, I grew up in Kingston, Jamaica, um, which was pretty good, a lot different than living in Newfoundland. I know, well, I, my birthday, I usually just go back to my birthday being in January. And growing up, I usually go to the beach and you know swim for my birthday. But living in Newfoundland in the past, like I guess 16, going on 17 years, a January birthday, I realize it hits different up here than it does growing up. So apart from, you know, just always romanticizing my childhood and being warm <laughs> and eating like you know fresh fruits from the trees and stuff. I do love living here. I appreciate it for its differences as well. But yeah, it was. I would say I, my childhood was pretty. It was pretty idyllic for like you know being outside, running around, swimming, like being in the sun. It was yeah. I enjoyed it. I loved That's it. That's really cool. Um, I gotta say like I myself am from Ontario, so I've really enjoyed Newfoundland the whole time I've been here. I fell in love with the place, and to be honest, man, I don't think I'll ever leave unless I unless I absolutely have to. Ah, uh, Newfoundlanders by choice. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, exactly. yeah, exactly. yeah. You know, when I was reading your book, I, I was, first of all, I was taken aback by how little I was informed about the content that you're writing about your book. So I was really curious, how did this book come to be, you know, like, like, what was the journey like for each of you in your own perspectives? Uh, well, I think I was taken aback by how little I knew about this. And I'm from Newfoundland. I grew up here. My family stretches back for generations. None of this was ever taught to me in school. None of it was ever sort of mentioned in our popular folklore or anything like that. And I stumbled across it from doing a, a couple interviews at my day job at CBC. There are a couple people out there doing some very interesting work on this. Uh, Bushra Janaid, who is, uh, you know, her family's both from Jamaica and from Africa. She grew up in St. John's. She's done a lot of interesting work. I interviewed um, uh, a woman about the new Emancipation Day. Uh, a holiday in, in Canada, which 
it marks the end of the British Empire's involvement with the transatlantic slave trade. And she said, wherever there was colonization, there was slavery. And then I actually said aloud, wait a minute, um, Newfoundland was a colony, does that mean there was slavery here? And she goes, oh yes. So then I just started asking a few questions, and when I started asking questions, found Xavier, who was asking was questions. Doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we joined forces. Yeah. yeah. I guess, I guess, from my perspective, um, it would be I was doing like trying to do research, looking at writing historical fiction, and looking at you know growing up in Jamaica, eating. We ate the same food. Like I grew up eating the same food. Like as a kid, as before I moved to Newfoundland, and then I moved to Newfoundland, and I kept on eating the same food, which was it was always curious to me. And I was like, wow, this place is thousands of miles away, like completely different climate, like none of these things grow here that I grew up eating, like I don't understand how these connections are there. So I was like, is it coincidence or you know, is there something deeper and like what other connections are there? You know, having lived here for over a decade, it's a lot of time to wonder and to think and you know, like Heather mentioned, Busher's exhibits and like Camille Turner also did an exhibit. So there are these people who are doing this work and then I was like, well, what stories could I tell about, you know, who else may have connected the two islands right. way back in the day? Because I was thinking of, you know, doing some historical fiction writing as well. And it was like people were answering those questions and we were like met up with Heather. Heather was asking those same questions, wow. talking to people who had been asking these questions professionally. Right. And yeah, really started filling in a lot of blanks and like fleshing out the story more. That's amazing. So, yeah. um, one of the things I realized when I was reading through the book is like, I mean, you guys have connected with several, you know, different people in different areas that are, you know, connecting the dots as well. To be honest, like, I feel like this is a subject that is under, you know, not talked about as much, you know, yeah. like, so like, what's the next step you know, for educating people and getting the word out there and, and teaching, you know, the history that should be taught. Yeah. Well, read our book. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you can do that. <laughs> but, but actually, there are so many people right now doing so much interesting work in this area. And uh, I, I can talk about Barry Galton, who's the archaeologist of the colony of Avalon. They're actually finding names. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and there are all kinds of researchers that are really you know, scouring records and looking for people in places you wouldn't think of looking for people for it. So I, I think from here on in, over the years to come, you're going to hear a lot more people talking about this. You're going to see a lot of new research. We're going to see names and places and concrete examples. Right. Heather, what do you think was most interesting that you uncovered in your research? Oh, I mean, it was all so interesting to me. I think the fact that we have names, okay. we have names like Dinah and Sancho mm -hmm. and Sarah, and they were black people who were enslaved, who lived and worked in Newfoundland as domestic enslaved labor. Um, we have names that we can connect to people who lived here hundreds of years ago. I think that to me was quite something. Right. Yeah. Excellent. I think for me also, I guess it was that human connection as well, especially like as a storyteller. And, you know, I, I did go into like this research and like of all the thinking I've been doing over the decades and stuff in a way to like write, a, like make up a story and to like, you know, write fiction, write historical fiction. But to really, like Heather was saying, like, you know, find out these names and find out the deeper story behind some of these people and like what led them to their situations, you know, what happened afterwards. Uh, even if it's just like these wills that we have to look for people. But that like added personal touch to be like, oh, this was like a full human life. You know, they like lived here, they did things here. They, you know, they were buried here, some of them. So that personal connection I wasn't really expecting to find as much in as much of the stories as we did. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think it just makes Newfoundland Labrador so much more of an interesting place to know that there's a broader range of people who were here for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. One of the questions I did have in mind though, you mentioned a lot of similarities between Newfoundland and, and Jamaica. So I knew myself that you know Newfoundland and Jamaica traded fish and rum and stuff, but that was as far as my knowledge went. So like, what are some of the similarities that you're alluding to? When uh, you uh, I would say in the molasses, there's the food, but it's like the people as well. I guess they're both islands. They're both 
They're both, you know, they have that island time. They're both the people in both places are equally as like, they're friendly to a to a point of like they want to know everything <laughs> about you. Yeah. It's like I know I've been to other places where your neighbors couldn't care about you, but like Newfoundland, Jamaica, like the people want to know you and they want to <laughs> know about you. And then there's the food, yeah. which was really what shocked me, like the molasses, the, the rum, the cod, like all the things I grew up eating and wouldn't wouldn't have expected to find here and so far away from Jamaica and like find it in such great quantities I, as well. I was so shocked that you knew and loved NTV. And NTV, oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, I also yeah. grew up with yeah. NTV. But then I thought, of course, from the Caribbean islands yeah. to the coast, so that's it. That's also, yeah. 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 I yeah. Was, yeah. I don't think I would be here or the person I am without NTV as well. Yeah. A lot yeah. of my formative years yeah. were spent with my grandmother watching NTV. And you know what, man? Let's give it up for getting NTV and oh, yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> The only thing I'm going to say to that is I think we should be getting some Jamaican programming yeah. the other way, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> just track exchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. With respect to the similarities in food and the rum and stuff, like I mean, do each of you have like a story that you're fond of that you'd like to share with us about maybe a time that you can remember with some of these ingredients or the rum or being in a kitchen, um, anything like that? Well, I grew up with salt cod. Yes. I mean, that's, uh, I'm first generation townie, so my, my parents are from rural Newfoundland and, and my parents love to be practitioners of the Bayman arts on the weekends. So <laughs> we always had cod at home. We, you know, we ate it at least a couple times a week. And I believe there was one summer, if I'm not mistaken, that my grandmother actually made a little uh, fish flake in the backyard in suburban East End St. John's. Oh, wow and dry a little bit of cod. That's really cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, and what about for yourself, Xavier? Say, for me, I also grew up with salt, with salt fish, just calling it salt fish. Um, and I went, I used to watch my parents and like my grandmother in the kitchen a lot. And I remember the first time, like it was my time to cook the salt fish. I don't know, I was responsible for some part of the salt fish. I don't know if it was the entire like ackee and salt fish or the whole meal, but I remember like it was, it was soaked, so I, you know, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. But I added salt to what? the dish, and everybody like freaking out, and everyone was like, "It was so inedible," and I was like so confused. I was probably like twelve or thirteen or something, but I just didn't understand that. You thought even, salt fish was add salt? You add, even oh, if you, when you soak it, it was like good to add salt. But they're like, "No, you're just like soaking it." to get it to the right salt content, and then you cook with it, you're not like soaking it to then add salt, so. But you know, I'll never forget <laughs> adding salt to salt fish. It's something that you only do once, <laughs> and you, <laughs> you never do it again, no, you, you know. Did you say ackee in what you were saying? Yeah. So in the book you mentioned about that, and I think you mentioned that it, if you didn't do it right, it was poisonous. Yes. So tell me a little bit about that, because I'm curious to know. Number one, what does it taste like and how do you not make it poisonous? How, what does Aki taste like? It's, uh, it's, it tastes, it's very interesting. It, like, it doesn't taste like anything else I've ever had before, that's for sure. Um, it's a fruit, um, so that started off, I guess, like, tomato is also a fruit, but it's usually, you don't cook it very much because you want it to stay firm. If your Aki is too soft and, like, like, placa and, like, mashed out like potatoes, it's usually not that good. So, it's pretty, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know how to describe it. Aki just tastes like, just tastes Aki. like ackee. It just tastes like ackee. It looks like eggs, but it does not taste like eggs because it's okay. like bright yellow. Um, but to not make it poisonous, you have to be very careful. Whenever you're buying it, you always want to make sure that you're buying ones that are open. They were opened on the tree. Because if you force it open, it's poisonous. And if it, you don't take off the seed properly and clean out the like the like little fibrous parts on the inside, it's also poisonous. So it's a very it's a very delicate process. I don't think I was ever responsible for preparing the ackee, thankfully, but yeah, no, it's very, it's very tricky. That'd be a lot of pressure. It's a whole lot of pressure. Heather, have you ever heard of ackee before? I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Okay. Uh, well, you know, the produce section <laughs> in this province, I know <laughs> if you're from Ontario and you're from Jamaica, this is not what you're used to, but I can tell you in the 70s, I thought tomatoes were orange. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, and not a word of a lie, the first time I had corn on the cob that was not in a can was when I went to grad school in Ontario when I was 23. Oh, wow. Corn on a cob came in a can. Wow. So, yeah. I, I don't think I've ever seen corn in a cob in a can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can get four. No, the, the four corn oh. so you could, like, yeah, like they're, you know, the, the ends are lopped off. Yeah. So they're almost like logs. Yeah. But they were like corn real cob. corn. Wow. But uh, then when I went to Ontario and I had actual fresh southwestern Ontario corn, it was like, Oh, okay, wow, <laughs> um, my little mind is blown now, you know, it's like, oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> what corn's supposed to be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, tell me, so like, I mean, what's next for the two of you? Like, I mean, do you have any force, like, I mean, are you working on any projects right now? Uh, any goals that you're trying to reach? Hmm. Uh, well, I am uh, right now. I'm trying to edit a novel, so yeah, I'm trying to finish up edits on that, which is going it's going slowly but surely. It's happening, and I'm trying to ca I'm casting a play. I'm doing a play oh, workshop wow. in March. So yeah, excellent. Yeah. Well, I got the day job, which is very busy, um, but I think I might be starting another nonfiction project with Boulder. I gotta say, there's probably a lot of people that are looking forward to to more material from the both of you. Um, you know, I, I got to say, like, hopefully the next time you guys finish a project and you'd like to have it promoted, like, I mean, definitely come back and, and you know, we'll do it again. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, I'm going to promote your book now. <laughs> Please do. And thank I want to thank you both once again for coming on the show. Thank hey, you I really for appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks this for having great. us. It's, it's been pleasure. delightful. Yes. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Black Harbor is a must read. Get your copy of boulderbooks.ca and Get it read. Thanks everybody for watching and thanks for tuning in online. I can't wait for you to meet our next guest here on What Do You Act. If you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, and you know what? Hug somebody and spread some love, man. We'll see you next time. Shall we all try? Yeah, please. Be my... Okay, well, cheers. 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 Ooh. cheers. Ooh.